Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Wyndham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Wyndham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. They've been building homes for people here in the U.S. and around the world since 1976. We're talking about Habitat for Humanity and find out the latest about their involvement with the community of Tolland County. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Housing affordable for all has been the dream of Habitat for Humanity ever since it was started back in the 1970s by husband and wife team Millard and Linda Fuller, who developed the idea of partnership housing centred on those in need of adequate shelter, working side by side with volunteers to build decent affordable homes. And since those beginnings, Habitat for Humanity now works in all 50 US states and more than 70 countries across the globe and has helped more than 46 million people. So closer to home, I visited the town of Vernon in Tolland County and sat down with the Chief Operating Officer of Habitat for Humanity North Central Connecticut, Jim Beeland, to find out more about their work and how they have expanded beyond just building homes for those in need. Jim, ever so many thanks for being on Connecticut East this week. My pleasure, thank you. Habitat for Humanity. We think we know what that means as people. We think it's all about just building houses, which of course is super important. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that, isn't it? It is. You don't realise the amount of lives you touch and the levels that it goes to, and you're correct, everyone thinks about the building of the houses, which is wildly important. But it also builds communities. It also changes the landscape and the dynamics of what a town may look like. Anything from financial financial literacy to repairs to even where we're having this interview today at our restore we touch many lives beyond what people think of the sticks and bricks or the or the building of the houses we are going to get into the depths of that in just a moment just Mm -hmm. give us a very quick potted history if you would because like i said we think we understand what habitat for humanity is just give us a quick history lesson on that if you would absolutely so habitat for humanity north central connecticut and we'll tie it in how it works nationally just celebrating we're in the midst of celebrating our 35th anniversary in the this part of the state. And over that time, we've affected the lives of over 350 families. And what was Habitat for Humanity of Hartford County now includes a good portion of Tallinn County, so 40 towns in total. And over that time, as I mentioned, we've had a chance to work and build and reshape, you know, over 300 houses in, into the community. And what was a single build back around 1990 continued to grow to what is multiple builds. Or We are currently working on two projects, one of five houses in in Hartford and just starting the beginning of what will be a 10 home neighborhood for in East Hartford. So the depth of where we go into the community continues to grow. You talk about Habitat for Humanity and many folks know it on a national and international scope. Habitat for Humanity was founded back in the mid 1970s and everybody thinks about former President Jimmy Carter and, and, and while he did not necessarily have his hand in the creation of Habitat for Humanity he certainly is the world's best ambassador that I've ever seen any entity and he's been on countless builds and has informed millions of people about the depths of everyone deserves an affordable place to live. And we can get into probably some of the facts and numbers with that, but the numbers are, are challenging to say the least. What was interesting is uh, while you and I were having a little pre-chat before we sat down to have the recording, you were saying he's more than just a face. It was never just a photo op with him. Just tell us a little bit about it because it's nice to know that because I think, you know, so many people here will see celebrities or famous people get involved with things and think, oh, well, you know, that's great. You know, they're just a little bit of a photo op or something, but that isn't and and wasn't the case, was it, with Jimmy Carter? No, absolutely not. Several members of our team have had a chance to go on builds over the years um, with the Carters, and it's a it is a, a larger you know program over overall. And and yes, you can have your picture taken, or but he is all about hammer in hand and trying to figure out what what project he is working on for the day. He knows the mission. While the outreach is important of communications, getting a family in a home is the of the utmost importance. 
and he's all business when it comes to that. Like we said, we're sat here at the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Vernon. Tell us a little bit about that because, as you said, you've moved into Tolland County. It is part of the uh, North Central Connecticut mission. So give us a little bit about this because you're still fairly new here in Tolland County, sure. aren't you? Sure. So we are at Restore, and, and for those of, who, you, those of you who don't know, Restore is a bit of a retail arm. All proceeds go to the overall mission of what it is we're trying to do. We operate two Restores, one in Bloomfield and the other one here in Vernon. The one in Vernon is just a little over one year old, but it is an opportunity for folks who drive back and forth to work every day to not only see what we're trying to do within the community, but also associate the fact that Restore and all of the products that we have are either new or gently used. Every dollar that is raised from our facility goes towards the overall mission, trying to make a difference in the greater community. And one of the things that you'll start to find with Restores is the folks that will come in, it's part of their weekly journey because items constantly change. Or if they're looking for something that we might not have, we'll put the word out and see if we could find it at our sister location. So it becomes a bit of a destination for the community, which is absolutely fantastic. The other thing, while we were looking around before, again, we started doing the uh, the interview here, paint. I didn't expect to find paint I here. know. So, and interestingly, recycled paint. So tell us about that, because I, I didn't even know you could recycle or you could get recycled paint. So for those of you who have ever gone to community center or the town recycling center, and, and I'm sure many of us have had to bring back their paint, and it's a half gallon here, it's a full gallon there, whatever case, but there is an organization that actually takes all of that unused paint, totally strips it down, recycles it, and reclaims it back to its original format. And then from there, you're able to tint it back to whatever color it is you need. So with this organization works with us, and, and while it's recycled, it's certainly fresh. It's fantastic, and it's a fraction of the cost of, of what you would buy at, let's say, the traditional big box stores. As I said, it really is quite interesting walking in. Hands up here. I've never been to a restore before, mm-hmm. so this is my first experience of a restore. It's very overwhelming. You walk in, and there's all this great stuff, and you're thinking, wow, you know, you you could spend a good couple of hours just in this particular store here, and I know this isn't one of your biggest ones, is it? No, no, and, and it's funny. We're, my wife and I will we'll pop in every once in a while and I know I have to set aside a good 30 minutes because there's always that one more thing we need to check on which leads to one more thing again and again and again which is exactly why we're here quite often talking with community leaders they automatically think that oh you're the restore guy which I'm not going to correct them for that because they're associating restore with habitat which is absolutely perfect talk to us a little bit as well about you know how you get this stuff for restore because like you said some of it's gently used uh, some of it is almost new as well I mean you get it from various sources, don't you? Yes, we do. You know, quite often we'll get phone calls every day saying, I have a a couch I'd like to donate or an estate sale or or I'm downsizing and the reasons are are varied. And and we'll always take those phone calls and we do pick up for deliveries. We we ask that we look at the the material first, but in in working within the community, we're all about that. But I think what people don't realize is quite often organizations and even larger businesses who are changing the decor or, or down or moving from Windsor to Hartford or whatever the case may be, are now starting to learn to give us a call and say, we have X amount of desks or we have an entire floor of material. We'd like to give this to to you guys for, for your mission and your organization. So it could range from a local insurance company to a local school to, to a local hospital. And the list goes on and on. And I think the big takeaway from that is it truly is a community mission because now we're touching some of the larger air quotes organizations and corporations to the mom and pop who's down the road also looking to help us out. It must be quite a thing when you get a call from one of these big corporate organizations because, I mean, again, you were saying, you know, you've had calls before and it's suddenly like, yeah, we've got 200 of this or we've got 100 of these and and we need to get rid of it really quickly, like within 72 hours. I mean, you know, just talk to us about that challenge because although you are an international organization, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how big you are, when you suddenly get that call, I'm sure it's like it's a bit of a like headless chicken situation, like we need to get moving. On this. Our staff of Restore are, are nothing short of amazing when I when I see the amount of material that comes in but also goes out, but also some of the turnaround teams. Just to say that they're they're dedicated would probably be a gross understatement. But they just love the fact that they're able to make a difference. And I also know that a lot of folks are coming down that are looking for whether it's a and I'm looking over your shoulder, I'm looking at a person who's buying a lamp right now, knowing that that lamp is probably three times as much at a traditional store, and they might not be able to afford that. And in today's economy, while it's definitely helping us, we hope that we're able to give back to the community by 
pricing that we're charging as well. Talk to us also about, you know, the volunteers, because like any organization, volunteers are a big thing. Many organizations just wouldn't simply be able to carry out, you know, their work and their mission without, you know, some some help from volunteers. How important is it for volunteers? And, and also, if somebody's interested, how can they get involved? Sure, absolutely. So the volunteer numbers are amazing when you when you think about it. Last year, over um, we had over 6,500 volunteering opportunities, and we had over 4,000 volunteers spend some time with us. And that could be anything from being on a build site, swinging a hammer for the day. And some folks might be a little intimidated with that, and that's fine. And we would never, we want to make sure that you're comfortable. You know, as we're chatting today, there's a group of high school students that come every week to help us out for a couple of hours. Sometimes there are senior um, centers that will send some folks that they would like to, or just folks that just want to help out, but they know that maybe the job site's not for them. We will be glad to help them with Restore. We have an appeal that's going out in just a couple of weeks. The appeal for donors, vitally important. What's also important is the fact that we'll have countless volunteers help to stuff 3,000 envelopes in the process. So I think there's a there's a fit for anyone, but it wouldn't be done without the immense amount of, of volunteers. And, and all it takes is just a couple of moments. I don't even want to say a couple of hours, but a couple of moments working to see what it is we're doing in this mission in your hook. Absolutely. So talk to us a little bit more, as I say, um, we're talking about Restore and we'll get back to that as well. Talk to us a little bit more, obviously, about the house bill thing, because like I said, it is something which people have traditionally known Habitat for Humanity for. You know, how essential are these houses? And talk to us, you know, talk to us about, you know, who gets those. Right. So the, the need for affordable housing is probably much more dire than, than anyone realizes. You know, over one in seven families probably allocate close to 50% of their monthly earnings just to get by month to month. So Connecticut is is actually vastly the, the shortage of affordable housing, both I rental and in purchase power than many other states. And the challenge that we have is finding land, finding affordable land. And, and, and that goes beyond just purchasing a land. It, it, it's working with our municipalities. It's working with our utilities. It's working with the community who might know of getting the word out that there's uh, in need of property for us to, to, you know, to work on for years to come. But that's only one segment of it. The amount of folks that would be interested, uh, and I'll give you a quick example. Last year, we have what we call an A meeting, or it's basically a, a meeting where, where people get to hear a little bit more about how it is I could become part of this program. And this would be for five or six houses. And in that particular case, 300 people should showed up. And out of those 300 people, they got to hear the process. And, and and I think it's imperative to know that we do not give away homes. Every home is a partnership with that individual. They have a 30-year mortgage, just like everywhere else. They have to put in sweat equity, meaning they have to spend at least 150 hours working on a home or working within the Habitat organization. They have to go through financial training. They have to be have a job and have a job that falls within a certain criteria of financial guidelines. So there are some very specific guidelines in which we use. But at the end of the day, that person and that family is a homeowner and that strengthens the entire community. I suppose the point to make as well, and I'm sure you'll correct me here, is, you know, often people fall outside like the, the guidelines of, of maybe more traditional organizations. So is this where Habitat Humanity can sort of like can step in, you know, if those individuals, like you said, they still have to meet criteria, but I mean, like veterans and things, I mean, you know, you're dealing with, with many, many different parts of, of the community, yes? Correct, correct. So while the income guidelines lines is is something that we we have to abide by. Quite often, you mentioned veterans, for example, we have a program that we're currently working on called a Brush with Kindness. And a Brush with Kindness program touches upon the elderly and the veterans. And these are folks who are already owned their home, but they're having trouble keeping up with it. And it might be they need a ramp to to get by, or they need new windows, or they need some general repairs because the the house is starting to to get into a little bit of disrepair. We focus that particular program uh, for our veteran population and for our elderly population. In terms of of actually partnering to be a homeowner. There are certain programs that we look at within the veteran community from time to time. Our, we just had a dedication earlier this year in Hartford of a historic home, fantastic home. And that was part of a, a gentleman who is now at least partially disabled, but is also a, a veteran of some uh, recent battles. What do people who, you know, as you say, put the sweat equity in and are fortunate enough to get a Habitat for Humanity home, just give us a sense of how they feel about that. Because to to go through that process, to know at the end of it, 
you are going to have this amazing house, a home to live in, provided by this incredible organisation. Mm. What sort of emotional trips, journeys do, do they go through? Because it must be quite an emotional thing for them because, as you say, they're building their future. The process takes a while. It's, it, it, you know, if, if a person comes in and says, tell me more, and starts the paperwork process of January of, of year one, even if they make it through to the very end and, and are chosen, that home might not be ready to the end of the following year. So they are totally vested in, in our process. And one thing that comes to mind, I was on a build a number of weeks back and a gentleman was, was next to me and we were chatting and I didn't realize that he was one of the homeowners for a build for next year. He was fantastic. But what I learned was that he, he works from 11 to 7 and he was on the build site from 8 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then he goes to his part-time job because right now that's what he needs to do because of the a rental for he and his three children. And so immediately you just learned that he becomes part of the the Habitat family and knowing that his story could be repeated countless times over and over and over. The other thing I would like to mention is during that recent dedication, the one startling takeaway that I had was the amount of folks that were there. And, and, and granted, there were staff there and there were local leaders, both from you know government and, and our church body. But there were many other folks that I, I was trying to figure out why the room was so crowded. And then it dawned on me, these were all the volunteers that came and helped to build the house over the past months in past and it became their vested interest to make sure that this family was now safe and secure which is amazing let's get back to restore as well because like we said we're here today at the the vernon restore uh, it is one of many restores not only here in the state of connecticut but around the country and probably around the world i'm yep. guessing as well they're very different though you were saying to me again before we like started to sit down there's obviously a similarity uh, between them but you know talk to us a little bit about you know the fact that they're all just that little bit different i think the similarity are the missionally we're all the same in the sense that the Indy dollars raised goes to your respective affiliate within your respective region. So our mission is totally aligned. I think the fascinating parts are everyone takes on a little bit of their community and that might mean the folks who volunteer to some of the material that might be sold if there's a local group or organization that uh, you partner with from time to time. So they do take a very specific uniqueness. I think the other similarity is the at any given time there's a hidden treasure that you're going to find. And this is kind of a, a fun little game. If you're ever traveling and going on vacation and you see a restore, but it's not in your area, stop in because it'll be a totally different world. And I, I mentioned to you prior before going on, my, my wife and I stopped at a, at a restore and we were away for a few days. And when we go up to Maine every summer, we stop at the restore in Portland um, because it just shows just community and generosity times 10 and knowing that there's a local flair wherever uh, wherever you go with it listening to you clearly very passionate uh, about the work that you do what you know what i'd like to ask this question uh, in interviews of people what gets you up every day what keeps you doing this knowing that you're making a difference i think that the the challenge is knowing that it's just not a flip of the switch but it is a very long it is a very long process but the process is needed to get there we are in we are in Tallinn county we're talking in vernon right now and you just don't come into a community to say hey we're ready the build a home. We want the townspeople to know who we are, what it is we do. And I think you have a chance to tell that story. So, you could, as, you, so as you could tell as I'm talking, the smile grows and probably the pace of my cadence gets quicker because you're just excited about what it is you do. And you have the opportunity to tell that story over and over. One of the first international builds I went on probably about eight years ago now, and I was painting a, the inside of a room and all of a sudden I felt a little tug behind me and it was Samantha, I later learned. And Samantha was four and she wanted to let me know this was her her room and she wanted to help me paint it and she took my roller and she gave the wall a few brush strokes to to put her mark on it and that will stick with me for all of my days knowing that this little person came up probably 40 pounds soaking wet saying this is my room I mean she was supervising and how it's done and that doesn't leave you it certainly doesn't doesn't you don't hear of many chief operating officers as well of companies that actually roll their sleeves up and actually get down to the nitty-gritty either I do my best helping and hopefully they do their best keeping me out of the way knowing my my limitations of of construction we have a fabulous crew so I make sure I stay in my lane as much as possible we always obviously like to let people know or understand how they can either get involved or how they can contact an organization and what's, you know, sort of like Restore, somebody wants to maybe be a volunteer, Restore all for, obviously, sure. as you say, the bell. Just give us the, the background as to how people can get in touch. The best way is the Clearinghouse is just go to our website, which is hfhncc.com 
org. From there, you will be able to find volunteering opportunities, restore opportunities. If you want to donate material, there's a, a clearinghouse from, from there, and we'll make sure that we, if we don't contact you directly or get back to you, quite often we'll get requests every day saying, I have a group, I have an organization, or I'd like to volunteer. What does that look like? The best way is probably always hfhncc.org. That, of course, is for the North Central Connecticut Habitat for Humanity, which is you, your mm-hmm. organization, but we should just also make the point that there are other chapters as well so obviously if somebody lives somewhere else in in the state in your area if they probably just want google so like habitat for humanity in their area they'll probably find who their the, local chapter is the infamous near me that you see on google so uh, yeah if you if you happen to be out of like i said we cover 40 communities 40 towns and, and quite often i'll, I'll hear our, our uh, office in a, and i'll say uh, as well if you live in the western part of the state or if you live down in new haven or or you know there's coastal fairfield county there's Housatonic valley there's southeastern Connecticut, all of our all of our brethren in, in other parts of uh, of the community for sure. So there's basically there's a habitat for humanity for everyone. Pretty much. Jim, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for giving us some insight and educating us more about what Habitat for Humanity does. Like we said, it isn't just about building homes, it's about building lives and building futures and obviously restore as well as is a big part of that. May it continue for many, many more years and thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much. And if you want to find out more about Habitat for Humanity where you live, the homes that might be available, or a local restore, or for volunteering opportunities, then visit their main website at habitat.org. It's hurricane season, and your trees can be damaged by high winds. Green Valley Tree has you covered with our emergency tree service outside of our regular business hours. We offer emergency tree service by bucket, crane, and climbing for residential, commercial, and even municipalities across eastern Connecticut. From full tree removals, uprooted or broken trees, to broken, hung up, or fractured tree limbs. Call our emergency hotline on 860-966-5710 or visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com. When it comes to making plans, you are the best. What about those round trips, which are perfect on your way there and perfect on your way back? Or those meetings with friends, surprise parties, camps, birthdays. The same way you plan for the important moments, start planning to protect you and your loved ones from a natural disaster. Sign up for local weather and emergency alerts. Prepare an emergency kit and make a family communications plan. Get started at ready.gov slash plan. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week. The Connecticut League of Conservation Voters, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization in the state, has released its annual environmental scorecard of lawmakers' votes on environmental policies. The scorecard is now in its 23rd year and helps give a snapshot of Senate and House bills during the 2023 legislative session. Laurie Brown is the executive director of the League and says there's nothing else available to voters to help them understand these important issues and who is and is voting on them. It is the only tool out there right now that really shows a composite of all of the environmental issues each session and scores our lawmakers. So they know if something's being scored, like we tell legislators all session long, what's big issues the environmental leaders are looking to pass and looking to do. And each year when something gets on that list, they do pay attention because they know they're going to be held accountable for their votes on that. Brown says although the scorecard provides a wealth of information for voters about their legislators, it also highlights a lack of transparency in the Connecticut legislature, especially over two recent climate bills. Both the major bills failed and that was a really big problem with this past session. So while there was a lot of public support and a lot of people were doing action alerts and members were calling their lawmakers, for whatever reason, the opposition to these various important environmental bills somehow managed to turn the priorities on their head and ended up paying less attention to environmental issues than they should have. One failed bill highlighted in the scorecard would have brought more transparency to the metropolitan district of Hartford County that controls the large water system in the state and its lack of accountability and policy decisions that often go against the public interest. This year's scorecard shows success for legislation affecting wildlife in the state, open spaces like parks and recreation, as well as early voting rights. It also showed significant work remains though on matters involving climate change, toxins that are polluting pollinators and birds of prey in the state, as well as pollution issues that ultimately affect the health of Connecticut communities. The full scorecard together with details 
of which legislator voted and how is available at the League's website, ctlcv.org. Businesses from across northeastern Connecticut had the chance to network and sell their services at a recent business showcase event held at EastCon in Hampton. The event was organized by the Northeastern Connecticut Chamber of Commerce. L. Jordan Goslin is the new executive director of the Northeastern Chamber and said it's a great event and opportunity for smaller businesses to get some exposure. We're making connections within our community. Another thing is referrals. I think it's a, an amazing opportunity for our community members to learn about what some of our smaller businesses do and then be able to refer that and allow that business to grow. So it's really nice to see a lot of referrals happening during this event as well. Gillian Clark is the co-founder of Two Dogs Coffee Company along with his wife and they will be opening a storefront in Danielson in early 2024 called Two Dogs Coffee Shop and said events like the Business Showcase give new startup companies like theirs a chance to be seen and heard. I want to walk away with letting everyone know what we're doing which is launching the coffee shop the Kickstarter launched today and the other thing is is we've met a lot of really great people within the chamber and we're looking for support from them. Also, maybe some ideas as well too and just allow them to get the word out. We're not asking for much in our Kickstarter and we know the town and community want this. The businesses within the chamber are fantastic at supporting each other. The Business Showcase is an annual event held by the Northeastern Connecticut Chamber which has over 550 business members ranging from large international companies to sole proprietors and covers 23 towns and municipalities in the northeastern region of the state. Yale University will join two other prestigious universities from New York in creating a new biohub that will look to build technologies to monitor and eradicate disease using the body's own immune system. Professor Andrea Califano is the president of the new Chan Zuckerberg Biohub New York and says they intend to bioengineer immune cells to create a kind of cellular endoscope that can be used in early stage disease detection. Zoom in on a particular organ and detect whether there's any problem, for instance, problems that may arise from exposure to toxic environments or cancer or maybe Alzheimer's and and Parkinson's and eventually actually fix those problems by engineering these cells to release specific molecules that could be therapeutically relevant. Dr. John Sang is a professor and director of the Yale Center for Systems and Engineering Immunology and said this new way of doing research is groundbreaking. Typical funding bodies and agencies, for example, the NIH, they tend to fund safer research, but things that are more blue sky and more ambitious and that would take much longer time frames. They are rare. So therefore, when this came out about two years ago, I was super excited. And there's some ideas that I've been thinking about that fit this perfectly. The aim of the Biohub is to solve scientific and medical challenges within 10 to 15 years. The New York Biohub joins two other hubs in San Francisco and Chicago and collectively are funded with a billion dollar investment by Mark Zuckerberg, owner of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, and his wife Priscilla Chan under the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And a new London educator has been named Connecticut Teacher of the Year. Governor Lamont announced recently that Kiana Foster Morrow, a fourth grade teacher at Nathan Hale Arts Magnet School in the city of New London, has been selected as Connecticut's 2024 Teacher of the Year. The recognition is the state's highest honor celebrating extraordinary teachers. Lamont and Local officials delivered the news to Foster Morrow during a surprise visit to her classroom, which was followed by a school-wide assembly and celebration with the honorees' students, fellow educators and family. Foster Morrow is a lifelong learner who is committed to empowering her students. As a black biracial woman, Foster Morrow says she understands the importance of diversity in education and believes teaching is a radical act that impacts minds and hearts, designing lessons that empower and tackle critical and relevant topics. The designation of Connecticut Teacher of the Year is is decided annually by the Connecticut Teacher of the Year Council, a group composed of former recipients of the honor and representatives from educational organizations, businesses, and the community. The council reviewed nearly 100 district-level teachers of the year through a rigorous selection process. Foster Morrow will now become Connecticut's representative for 2024 National Teacher of the Year. She succeeds Connecticut's 2023 Teacher of the Year, Carolyn Yelma, a science teacher from Bristol Eastern High School. (music) 
That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East this week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening.